Hiya! Welcome to Sniper's Rest. Sniper's Rest is the last best rest stop in the here and there. The place between where you're coming from and where you're going. I am Sniper Shadow and I reside here in Sniper's Rest as a guiding custodian to those who pass through here. I visit the worlds within the multiverse often, but I am always here to guide and care for travellers such as yourself that pass through the here and there. Welcome my friend! Come on in, sit down. I've got an array of recipes for you to try. I'm quite proud of my new tomato soup recipe, if you'd like a bowl. Or perhaps a salad? I also have some gulo here from last night. Hmm? Why is it called trouble? <laughs> well, it's a curry, and the heat kind of sneaks up on you. One of my regulars ordered it once, and was not quite ready for the intense heat. She spent the next five minutes spluttering into her ale, muttering the phrase gulo, or trouble, and that's been called that ever since. Please take a rest here before continuing your journey. This week we are continuing the picture of Dorian Gray. After showing Basil the portrait of his soul, Dorian is filled with hatred and blames Basil for the way he has become. He murders him in a fit of rage. Despite his detachment to the deed, he knows he must cover it up. He calls upon an old friend and with their help hides the terrible crime he has committed. Things are not looking good for our Mr. Grey. Let's see what happens next. Chapter 15 That evening, at 8.30, exquisitely dressed and wearing a large buttonhole of Palmer violets, Dorian Grey was ushered into Lady Narraborough's drawing room by bowing servants. His forehead was throbbing with maddened nerves and he felt wildly excited but his manner, as he bent over his hostess's hand, was as easy and graceful as ever. Perhaps one never seemed so much at one's ease when one has to play a part. Certainly, no one looking at Dorian Gray that night could have believed that he had passed through a tragedy as horrible as any tragedy of our age. Those finely shaped fingers could never have clutched a knife for sin, nor those smiling lips have cried out on God and goodness. He himself could not help wondering at the calm of his demeanour, and for a moment felt keenly the terrible pleasure of a double life. It was a small party, got up rather in a hurry by Lady Narraborough, who was a very clever woman with what Lord Henry used to describe as the remains of a really remarkable ugliness. She had proved an excellent wife to one of our most tedious ambassadors, and having buried her husband properly in a marble mausoleum which she herself had designed, and married off her daughters to some rich, rather elderly men, she devoted herself now to the pleasures of French fiction, French cookery, and French esprit when she could get it. Dorian was one of her special favourites, and she always told him that she was extremely glad she had not met him in early life. I know, my dear, I should have fallen madly in love with you, she used to say, and thrown my bonnet right over the mills for your sake. It is most fortunate that you were not thought of at the time. As it was, our bonnets were so unbecoming, and the mills were so occupied in trying to raise the wind, that I never even had a flirtation with anybody. However, that was all Narraborough's fault. He was dreadfully short-sighted, and there is no pleasure in taking a husband who never sees anything. Her guests this evening were rather tedious. The fact was, as she explained to Dorian, behind a very shabby fan. One of her married daughters had come up quite suddenly to stay with her, and to make matters worse, had actually brought her husband with her. I think it is most unkind of her, my dear, she whispered. Of course I go and stay with them every summer after I come home from Hamburg. But then an old woman like me must have fresh air sometimes, and besides, I really wake them up. You don't know what an existence they lead down there. It is pure, unadulterated country life. 
They get up early because they have so much to do, and they go to bed early because they have so little to think about. There has not been a scandal in the neighbourhood like that since the time of Queen Elizabeth, and consequently they fall asleep after dinner. You shan't sit next to either of them. You shall sit by me and amuse me. Dorian murmured a graceful compliment and looked around the room. Yes, it certainly was a tedious party. Two of the people he had never seen before, and the others consisted of Ernest Harridan, one of those middle-aged mediocrities so common in London clubs, who have no enemies, but are thoroughly disliked by their friends. Lady Ruxton, an overdressed woman of forty-seven with a hooked nose who was always trying to get herself compromised but was so peculiarly plain that to her great disappointment no one would ever believe anything against her. Mrs. Erline, pushing nobody with that delightful lisp and that Venetian red hair, Lady Alice Chapman, his hostess's daughter, a dowdy dull girl with one of those characteristic British faces, once seen are never remembered, and her husband, a red-cheeked, white-whiskered creature, who, like so many of his class, was under the impression of inordinate joviality, can atone for the lack of any ideas. He was rather sorry he had come, till Lady Narraborough, looking at the great Olamaloo gilt clock that sprawled in gaudy curves on the mauve-draped mantel-shelf, exclaimed, "'How horrid of Henry Wotton to be so late!' I sent round to him this morning on chance, and he promised faithfully to not disappoint me. It was some consolation that Harry was to be there, and when the door opened, and he heard his slow musical voice lending charm to some insincere apology, he ceased to feel bored. But at dinner he could not eat anything. Plate after plate went away untasted. Lady Narraborough kept scolding him for what she called an insult to poor Aphrodite, who invented this menu especially for you. And now and then, Lord Henry looked across at him, wondering at his silence and abstract manner. From time to time, the butler filled his glass with champagne. He drank eagerly, and his thirst seemed to increase. Dorian, said Lord Henry at last as the chaffroid was beginning to be handed around. "'What is the matter with you tonight? "'You are quite out of sorts.' "'I believe he is in love,' cried Lady Narraborough, "'and that he is afraid to tell me, for fear I should be jealous. "'He is quite right. I certainly should.' "'Dear Lady Narraborough,' murmured Dorian, smiling, I have not been in love for a whole week, not, in, in fact, since Madame de Ferrel left town. How you men can fall in love with that woman, exclaimed the old lady, I really cannot understand it. It is simply because she remembers you when you were a little girl, Lady Narraborough, says Lord Henry. She is the only link between us and your short frocks. She does not remember my short frocks at all, Lord Henry, but I remember her very well at Vienna thirty years ago, and how décolleté she was then. She is still décolleté, he answered, taking an olive in his long fingers, and when she is in a very smart gown. She looks like an edition de luxe of a bad French novel. She is really wonderful and full of surprises. Her capacity for family affection is extraordinary. When her third husband died, her hair turned quite gold from grief. How can you, Harry? cried Dorian. It is a most romantic explanation laughed the hostess. But her third husband, Lord Henry, you don't mean to say Pharrell is the fourth. Certainly, Lady Narraborough. Well, I don't believe a word of it. Well, just ask Mr. Grey. He is one of her most intimate friends. 
Is this true, Mr. Gray? She assures me so, Lady Nerabera, said Dorian. I asked whether, like Marguerite de Nove, she had their hearts embalmed and hung on her girdle. She told me she didn't, because none of them had any hearts at all. Four husbands, upon my word, that is true de sel. Trudeau does, I tell her, said Dorian. Oh, she is audacious enough for anything, my dear. And what is Pharrell like? I don't know him. The husbands of very beautiful women belong to the criminal classes, said Lord Henry, sipping his wine. Lady Narraborough hit him with her fan. Lord Henry, I am not at all surprised that the world says you are extremely wicked. But what world says that? asked Lord Henry, elevating his eyebrows. It can only be the next world. This world and I are on excellent terms. Everybody I know says you are very wicked, cried the old lady, shaking her head. Lord Henry looked serious for some moments. It is perfectly monstrous, he said at last. The way people go about nowadays saying things against one behind one's back that are absolutely and entirely true. Isn't he incorrigible? cried Dorian, leaning forward in his chair. I hope so, said his hostess, laughing. But if you really must worship Madame de Ferrol in this ridiculous way, I shall have to marry again, as so to be in the fashion. You will never marry again, Lady Narabara, broke in Lord Henry. You were far too happy. When a woman marries again, it is because she detested her first husband. When a man marries again, it is because he adored his first wife. Women try their luck. Men risk theirs. Narraborough wasn't perfect, cried the old lady. If he had been, you would not have loved him, my dear lady, was the rejoinder. Women love us for our defects. If we have enough of them, they will forgive us for everything, even our intellects. You will never ask me to dinner again after saying this, I am afraid, Lady Narrabara, but it is quite true. Of course it is true, Lord Henry. If we women did not love you for your defects, where would you all be? Not one of you would ever be married. You would be a set of unfortunate bachelors. Not, however, that would alter you all that much. Nowadays, all the married men live like bachelors, and all the bachelors like married men. Fin du siècle, murmured Lord Henry. Fin du globe, answered his hostess. I wish it were fin du globe, said Dorian with a sigh. Life is a great disappointment. Ah, my dear, cried Lady Narraborough, putting on her gloves. Don't tell me you have exhausted life. When a man says that, one knows that life has exhausted him. Lord Henry is very wicked, and I sometimes wish that I had been. But you are made to be good. You look so good. I must find you a nice wife. Lord Henry, don't you think that Mr. Grey should get married? I am always telling him so, Lady Narraborough, said Lord Henry with a bow. Well, we must look out for a suitable match for him. I shall go through Debrett very carefully tonight and draw out a list of all eligible young ladies. With their ages, Lady Narraborough asked Dorian. Of course, with their ages, slightly edited, but nothing must be done in a hurry. I want it to be what the Morning Post calls a suitable alliance, and I want you both to be happy. What nonsense people talk about to happy marriages, exclaimed Lord Henry. A man can be happy with any woman as long as he does not love her. Ah, what a cynic you are, cried the old lady 
pushing back her chair and nodding to Lady Ruxton. You must come and dine with me soon again. You really are an admirable tonic. Much better than what Sir Andrew prescribes for me. You must tell me what people you would like to meet, though. I want it to be a delightful gathering. I like men who have a future and women who have a past, he answered. Or do you think that would make a petticoat party? I fear so, she said, laughing as she stood up. A thousand pardons, my dear Lady Ruxton, she added. I didn't see that you hadn't finished your cigarette. Never mind, Lady Narraborough. I smoke a great deal too much. I am going to limit myself for the future. Pray don't, Lady Ruxton, said Lord Henry. Moderation is a fatal thing. Enough is as bad as a meal. More than enough is as good as a feast. Lady Ruxton glanced at him curiously. You must come and explain that to me some afternoon, Lord Henry. It sounds a fascinating theory, she murmured as she swept out of the room. Now, don't you stay too long over your politics and scandal, cried Lady Narraborough from the door. If you do, we are sure to squabble upstairs. The men laughed, and Mr. Chapman got up solemnly from the foot of the table and came up to the top. Dorian Gray changed his seat and went and sat by Lord Henry. Mr. Chapman began to talk in a loud voice about the situation in the House of Commons. He gawfed at his adversaries. The word doctrine, the word full of terror to the British mind, reappeared from time to time in between his explosions. An alliterative prefix served as an ornament of oratory. He hoisted the Union Jack on the pinnacles of thought. The inherited stupidity of the race, the sound English common sense he jovially termed it, was shown to be properly bulwark for society. A smile curved Lord Henry's lips, and he turned round and looked at Dorian. "'Are you better, my dear fellow?' he asked. "'You seemed rather out of sorts at dinner.' "'I am quite well, Harry.' I am tired. That is all. You were charming last night. The little Duchess is quite devoted to you. She tells me she is going down to Selby. She has promised to come on the 20th. Is Monmouth to be there too? Oh yes, Harry. He bores me dreadfully. Almost as much as he bores her. She is very clever, and too clever for a woman. She lacks the indefinable charm of weakness. Is it the feet of clay that makes the gold of the image precious? Her feet are very pretty, but they are not the feet of clay. White porcelain feet, if you like. They have been through the fire, and what fire does not destroy it, it hardens. She has had experiences. How long has she been married? asked Dorian. An eternity, she tells me. I believe, according to peerage, it is ten years. But ten years with Monmouth must be like an eternity with time thrown in. Who else is coming? Oh, the Willoughbys. Lord Rugby and his wife. Our hostess. Geoffrey Clouston, the usual set. I have asked Lord Gratran. I like him, said Lord Henry. A great many people don't, but I find him charming. He atones for being occasionally somewhat overdressed by being always absolutely overeducated. He is a very modern type. I do not know if he will be able to come, Harry. He may have to go to Monte Carlo with his father. Ah, what a nuisance people's people are. Try and make him come. By the way, Dorian, you ran off very early last night. You left before eleven. What did you do afterwards? Did you go straight home? 
Dorian glanced at him hurriedly and frowned. No, Harry, he said at last. I did not get home until nearly three. Did you go to the club? Yes, he answered, then bit his lip. No, I don't mean that. I didn't go to the club. I walked about. I forget what I did. How inquisitive of you are, Harry. You always want to know what one has been doing. I always want to forget what I have been doing. I came in at half past two, if you wish to know the exact time. I had left my latch key at home, and my servant had to let me in. If you want any corroborative evidence on the subject, you can ask him. Lord Henry shrugged his shoulders. My dear fellow, as if I cared. Let us go to the drawing room. No sherry, thank you, Mr. Chapman. Something has happened to you, Dorian. Tell me what it is. You are not yourself tonight. Don't mind me, Harry. I am irritable and out of temper. I shall come round to see you tomorrow. Or the next day. Make my excuses to Lady Narrowborough. I shan't go upstairs. I shall go home. I must go home. All right, Dorian. I dare say I shall see you tomorrow at tea time. The Duchess is coming. I will try to be there, Harry, he said, leaving the room. As he drove back to his own house, he was conscious that the sense of terror he thought he had strangled had come back to him. Lord Henry's casual questioning had made him lose his nerve for the moment, and he wanted his nerve still. Things that were dangerous had to be destroyed. He winced. He hated the idea of even touching them. Yet it had to be done. He realized, and when he had locked the door of his library, he opened the secret press into which he had thrust Basil Hallward's coat and bag. A huge fire was blazing. He piled another log on it. The smell of the singeing clothing and burning leather was horrible. It took him three quarters of an hour to consume everything. At the end, he felt faint and sick, and having lit some allergen pastels in a pierced copper brazier, he bathed his hands and forehead with the cool musk-scented vinegar. Suddenly, he started. His eyes grew strangely bright, and he gnawed nervously at his underlip. Between two of the windows stood a large Florentine cabinet, made out of ebony and inlaid with ivory and blue lapis. He watched it as though it were a thing that could fascinate and make afraid, as though it held something that he longed for and yet almost loathed. His breath quickened, a mad craving came over him. He lit a cigarette and then threw it away. His eyelids drooped till the long, fringed lasses almost touched his cheek. He still watched the cabinet. At last he got up from the sofa on which he had been lying, went over to it, and having unlocked it, touched some hidden spring. A triangular drawer passed slowly out. His fingers moved instinctively towards it, dipped in and closed in on something. It was a small Chinese box of black and gold dust lacquer, elaborately wrought, the sides patterned with curved waves and silken cords hung around the crystals and tasseled in plaited metal threads. He opened it. Inside was a green paste, waxy in luster, the odour curiously heavy and persistent. He hesitated for some moments, with a strangely immobile smile upon his face. Then shivering, though the atmosphere of the room was terribly hot, he drew himself up and glanced at the clock. It was twenty minutes to twelve. He put the box back, shutting the cabinet doors as he did so, and went into his bedroom. As midnight was striking, bronze blows upon the dusky air, Dorian Gray, dressed commonly, and with a muffler wrapped around his throat, crept quietly out of his house. In Bond Street, he found a hansom with a good horse. He hailed it, and in a low voice gave the driver an address. The man shook his head. "'Tis too far for me,' he muttered. "'Here is a sovereign for you,' said Dorian. "'You shall have another if you drive fast.' "'All right, sir,' answered the man. "'You'll be there in an hour.' And after his fare had got in, he turned his horse round and drove rapidly towards the river. Chapter 16 A cold rain began to fall. 
and the blurred street lamps looked ghastly in the dripping mist. The public houses were just closing, and dim men and women were clustering in broken groups round their doors. For some of the bars came the sound of horrible laughter, in others drunkards brawled and screamed. Lying back in the hansom with his hat pulled over his forehead, Dorian Gray watched with listless eyes the sordid shame of the great city, and now and then he repeated to himself the words that Lord Henry had said to him on the first day they had met. To cure the soul by means of senses, and the senses by means of the soul. Yes, that was the secret. He had often tried it, and would try it again now. There were opium dens where one could buy oblivion, dens of horror where the memory of old sins could be destroyed by the madness of sins that were new. The moon hung low in the sky like a yellow skull. From time to time, a huge misshapen cloud stretched a long arm across and hid it. The gas lamps grew fewer and the streets more narrow and gloomy. Once the man lost his way and had to drive back half a mile. A steam rose from the horse as it splashed up in the puddles. The side windows of the hansom were clogged with grey flannel mist. To cure the soul by means of the senses, and the senses by means of the soul. How the words rang in his ear, his soul certainly was sick to death. Was it true that the senses could cure it? Innocent blood had been spilled. What could atone for that? Ah, for that there was no atonement. But though forgiveness was impossible, forgetfulness was possible still. And he was determined to forget, to stamp out the thing, to crush it as one would crush the adder that had stung one. Indeed, what right had Basil to have spoken to him as if he had done? who had made him a judge over others. He had said things that were dreadful, horrible, not to be endured. On and on plodded the hansom, growing slower, it seemed to him, at each step. He thrust up the tarp and called to the man to drive faster. The hideous hunger for opium began to gnaw at him. His throat burned and his delicate hands twitched nervously together. He struck at the horse madly with his stick. The driver laughed and whipped up. He laughed in answer, and the man was silent. The way seemed indeterminable, and the streets like the black web of some sprawling spider. The monotony became unbearable, and as the mist thickened, he felt afraid. Then they passed by lonely brick fields. The fog was lighter here and he could see the strange bottle-shaped kilns with their orange fan-like tongues of fire. Dogs barked as they went by, and far away in the darkness some wandering seagulls screamed. The horse stumbled in a rut, then swerved aside and broke into a gallop. After some time, they left the clay road and rattled again over rough paven streets. Most of the windows were dark. But now and then fantastic shadows were silhouetted against some lamp-lit lamp bind. He watched them curiously. They moved like monstrous marionettes and made gestures like live things. He hated them. A dull rage was in his heart. As they turned a corner, a woman yelled something at them from an open door, and two men ran after the hansom for about a hundred yards. The driver beat at them with his whip. It is said that passion makes one think in a circle. Certainly with hideous iteration, the bitten lips of Dorian Gray shaped and reshaped those subtle words that dealt with soul and sense, till he had found in them the full expression, as it were, of his mood and justified by intellectual approval, passions that without such justification would still have dominated his temper. From cell to cell of his brain crept the one thought, and the wild desire to live, most terrible of all man's appetites, quickened into force with each trembling nerve and fibre. Ugliness that had once been hateful to him because it made things real, became dear to him now for that very reason. Ugliness was the one reality, the coarse brawl, the loathsome den, 
the cruel violence of disordered life, the very vileness of thief and outcast, were more vivid in their intense actuality of impression than all the gracious shapes of art, the dreamy shadows of song. They were what he needed for forgetfulness. In three days, he would be free. Suddenly, the man drew up with a jerk at the top of a dark lane. Over the low roofs and jagged chimney stacks of the houses rose the, rose the black masts of ships. Wreaths of white mist clung like ghostly sails to the yards. Somewhere about here, sir, ain't it? He asked huskily through the trap. Dorian started and peered round. This will do, he answered, and having got out hastily and given the driver the extra fare he had promised him, he walked quickly in the direction of the quay. Here and there a lantern gleamed at the stir of some huge merchantman. The light shook and splintered in the puddles. A red glare came from an outward-bound steamer that was coaling. The slimy pavement looked like wet Macintosh. He hurried on towards the left, glancing back now and then to see if he was being followed. In about seven or eight minutes, he reached a small shabby house that was wedged in between two gaunt factories. In one of the top windows stood a lamp. He stopped and gave a peculiar knock. After a little time, he heard steps in the passage and the chain being unhooked. The door opened quietly, and he went in without saying a word to the squat, misshapen figure that flattened itself into the shadow as he passed. At the end of the hall hung a tattered green curtain that swayed and shook in the gusty wind which had followed him in from the street. He dragged it aside and entered a low, long room which looked as if it had been once a third-rate dancing saloon. Shrill, flaring gas jets, dulled and distorted in the fly-blown mirrors that faced them, were ranged around the walls. Greasy reflectors of ribbed tin backed them, making quivering disks of light. The floor was covered with orca-coloured sawdust, trampled here and there into mud, and stained with dark rings of spilled liquor. Some were crouching by the little coal stove, playing with bone counters and showing their white teeth as they chattered. In one corner, with his head buried in his arms, a sailor sprawled over a table, and by the tawdy painted bar that ran across one complete side stood two haggard women, mocking an old man who was brushing the sleeves of his coat with an expression of disgust. He thinks he's got red ants on him, laughed one of them as Dorian passed by. The man looked at her in terror and began to whimper. At the end of the room there was a little staircase leading to a darkened chamber. As Dorian hurried up its three rickety steps, a heavy odour of opium met him. He heaved a deep breath and his nostrils quivered with pleasure. When he entered, a young man with smooth yellow hair who was bending over a lamp lighting a long thin pipe looked up at him and nodded in a hesitating manner. You hear, Adrian, muttered Dorian. Where else should I be? he answered listlessly. None of the chaps will speak to me now. I thought you had left England. Darlington is not going to do anything. My brother paid the bill at last. George doesn't speak to me either. I don't care, he added with a sigh. As long as one has this stuff, one doesn't want friends. I think I've had too many friends. Dorian winced and looked round at the grotesque things that lay in such fantastic postures on the ragged mattresses. The twisted limbs and gaping mouths, the staring lustreless eyes fascinated him. He knew in what strange heavens they were suffering and what dull hells were teaching them the secret of some new joy. They were better off than he was. He was prisoned in thought 
memory like a horrible milady was eating away at his soul. From time to time he seemed to see the eyes of Basil Hallwood looking at him, yet he felt he could not stay. The presence of Adrian Singleton troubled him. He wanted to be where no one would know who he was. He wanted to escape from himself. I am going on to the other place, he said after a pause. On the wharf. Yes. That mad cat is should to be there. They won't have her in this place now. Dorian shrugged his shoulders. I am sick of women who love one. Women who hate one are much more interesting. Besides, the stuff is better. Much the same. I like it better. Come and have something to drink. I must have something. I don't want anything, murmured the young man. Never mind. Adrian Singleton rose up wearily and followed Dorian to the bar. A man in a ragged turban and a shabby ulster grinned a hideous greeting as he thrust a bottle of brandy and two tumblers in front of them. The women sidled up and began to chatter. Dorian turned his back on them and said something in a low voice to Adrian Singleton. A crooked smile withered across the face of one of the women. We are very proud tonight, she sneered. For God's sake, don't talk to me, cried Dorian, stamping his foot on the ground. What do you want? Money? Here it is. Don't ever talk to me again. Two red sparks flashed for a moment in the woman's sodden eyes, then flickered out and left them dull and glazed. She tossed her head and raked the coins off the counter with greedy fingers. Her companion watched her enviously. It's no use, sighed Adrian Singleton. I don't care to go back. What does it matter? I am quite happy here. You will write me if you want anything, won't you? Dorian said after a pause. Perhaps. Good night, then. Good night answered the young man, passing up the steps and wiping his parched mouth with a handkerchief. Dorian walked to the door with a look of pain on his face. As he drew the curtain aside, a hideous laugh broke from the painted lips of the women who had taken his money. There goes the devil's bargain, she hiccuped in a hoarse voice. Curse you, he answered. Don't call me that. She snapped her fingers. Prince Charming is what you like to be called, ain't it? She yelled after him. The drowsy sailor leaped to his feet as she spoke and looked wildly around. The sound of shutting door fell on his ear and he rushed out in pursuit. Dorian Gray hurried along the quay through the drizzling rain. His meeting with Adrian Singleton had strangely moved him and he wondered if the ruin of that young life was really to be laid at his door, as Basil Hallward had said to him, with such infamy of insult. He bit his lip, and for a few seconds his eyes grew sad. Yet after all, what did it matter to him? One's days were too brief to take the burden of another's errors on one's shoulders. Each man lived his own life and paid his own price for living it. The only pity that one had to pay so often for a single fault. One had to pay over and over again indeed. In her dealings with man, destiny never closed her accounts. There are moments, psychologists tell us, when the passions for sin, or for what the world calls sin, so dominates every nature that every fiber of the body, as every cell of the brain, seem to be instinct with fearful impulses. Men and women at such moments lose the freedom of their will. They move to their terrible end as automatons move. Choice is taken from them, and conscience is either killed, or if it lives at all, lives but to give rebellion its fascination and disobedience its charms. For all sins, as theologians weary not of reminding us, are sins of disobedience. 
When that high spirit, that morning star of evil, fell from heaven, it was as a rebel that he fell. Callous, concentrated on evil, with stained mind and soul hungry for rebellion, Dorian Gray hastened on, quickening his step as he went, but as he darted aside into a dim archway that had served him often as the shortcut to the ill-famed place where he was going. He felt himself suddenly seized from behind, and before he had time to defend himself, he was thrust back against the wall with a brutal hand around his throat. He struggled madly for his life, and by a terrible effort, wrenched the tightening fingers away. In a second he heard the click of a revolver, and saw the gleam of a polished barrel, pointing straight at his head, and the dusky form of a short, thick-set man facing him. "'What do you want?' he gasped. "'Keep quiet,' said the man. "'If you stir, I'll shoot you. "'You are mad. What have I done to you?' "'You wrecked the life of Sybil Vane,' was the answer. "'And Sybil Vane was my sister. "'She killed herself. I know it. "'Her death is at your door. "'I swore I would kill you in return. "'For years I have sought you. "'I had no clue, no trace. "'The two people... Who could have described you were dead. I knew nothing of you but the pet name that she used to call you. I heard it tonight by chance. Make your peace with God, for tonight you are going to die. Dorian Gray grew sick with fear. I never knew her, he stammered. I never heard of her. You are mad. You had better confess for your sin. For I, as sure as I am James Vane, you are going to die. There was a horrible moment. Dorian did not know what to say or do. Down on your knees, growled the man. I give you one minute to make your peace. No more. I go on board tonight for India, and I must do my job first. One minute. That's all. Dorian's arm fell quickly to his side. Paralyzed with terror, he did not know what to do. Suddenly, a wild hope flashed across his brain. Stop, he cried. How long ago is it since your sister died? Quick, tell me. Eighteen years, said the man. Why do you ask of me? What do the years matter? Eighteen years, laughed Dorian, with a touch of triumph in his voice. Eighteen years. Set me under the lamp. Look at my face. James Vane hesitated for a moment, not understanding what was meant. Then he seized Dorian Gray and dragged him from the archway. Dim and wavering as was the wind-blown light, yet it served to show him the hideous error as it seemed into which he had fallen, for the face of the man he had sought to kill had all the bloom of boyhood, all the unsatin purity of youth. He seemed little more than a lad of twenty summers, hardly older, if older indeed at all, than his sister had been when they had parted so many years ago. It was obvious that this was not the man who had destroyed her life. He loosened his hold and reeled back. My God! Ah, oh, my God, and I would have murdered you! Dorian Gray drew a long breath. You have been on the brink of committing a terrible crime, my man. He looked at him sternly. Let this be a warning to you not to take vengeance into your own hands. Forgive me, sir, muttered James Vane. I was deceived. A chance word I heard in that damned den set me on the wrong track. You had better go home and put that pistol away, or you may get into trouble, said Dorian, turning on his heel and going slowly down the street. James Vane stood on the pavement in horror. He was trembling from head to foot. After a little while, a black shadow that had been creeping along the dripping wall moved out into the light and came close to him with stealthy footsteps. He felt a hand laid on his arm and looked around with a start. It was one of the women who had been drinking at the bar. Why didn't you kill him? She hissed out putting a haggard face quite close to him. I knew you were following him when you rushed out from Daly's. You fool! You should have killed him. He has lots of money, and he's bad as bad. 
He's not the man I'm looking for, he answered. I want no man's money. I want a man's life. A man's life who must be nearly 40 now. This one is little more than a boy. Thank God I have not got his blood on my hands. The woman gave a bitter laugh. Little more than a boy, she sneered. Why, man, it's nine on eighteen years since Prince Charming made me what I am. You lie, cried James Vane. She raised her hand up to heaven. Before God, I am telling the truth. Before God? Strike me dumb if it ain't so. He was the worst one that comes here. They say he has sold himself to the devil for a pretty face. It's nigh on eighteen years since I met him. He hasn't changed much since then. I have, though, she said with a sickly leer. You swear this. I swear it. Came in the hoarse echo from her flat mouth. But don't give me away to him, she whined. I am afraid of him. Let me have some money for my night's lodgings. He broke from her with an oath and rushed to the corner of the street. But Dorian Gray had disappeared. When he looked back, the woman had vanished also. That concludes our tale for this week, my friend. Please return next week and we will continue our journey through The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. If you wish to rest here some more, please find a space that suits you. Whether you curl up by the fire, partake in some food and beverages in our kitchen, take a nap in one of our many rooms, or take a stroll around the garden, please know you are always welcome at Sniper's Rest, my friend. If you are continuing your journey, the multiverse has an interesting variety in store should you so choose. To the north, your little one needs your help. She is trapped, and the woman who calls herself her mother is experimenting on her. Her only connection to you is a simple radio. Find her within this world underneath the rest of the world, dilapidated and falling apart. She needs her dad. Save her. To the west, in the only spaceship with the new FTL tech, this massive mission is said to be the first of its kind. You're heading to colonize a new world. However, nothing ever goes to plan, does it? Awoken from cryosleep, it looks like the folks on the ship have gone mad. Time to figure out what's going on. Time to survive. To the east, time for science and magic. Survive in a world that you've been brought to by a mysterious paranormal force. You're going to have to use everything and every smart you have to get home in one piece. Good luck and don't starve. And if you are making your own way out there, good luck my friend, wherever you end up. Wherever you come from and wherever you're going, thank you for spending some time here with us at Sniper's Rest. Remember to take care of yourself, be kind to others, Hydrate, take a moment to look out into the world and marvel at how incredible it all is. How incredible you are, friend. Until next time, please take care on your way.